Hi, I'm Greg Kinnear, and welcome to the Larry Sanders DVD. Thank you for selecting the documentary track. This was a show that really broke through for HBO in the terms of getting HBO recognized. Larry Sanders' show convinced us, yeah, we can. If we do it differently, if we do it in a way that has a voice. Celebrity is an American illness. And this was a show that lanced the boil. Every single human being connected to show business was watching that show every single week. But everybody in every work situation said, this show speaks to us. It became the coolest thing in the world to be affiliated with The Larry Sanders Show. It really showed the shades of gray of the human persona and the dark side of the psyche uh, in ways that other situation comedies wouldn't even come close to touching. When I saw um, Larry Sanders, I was blown away. I thought that's how good television can be. Instinctually, I knew walking on the set like, Oh, like this is for real. It was unlike anything that I'd ever seen on, on, on television. Larry Sanders in many ways showed the future, you know? The semi, you know, that, 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 that air of improvisation, that, that, the hyper-reality, the use of film. So from there comes Soprano, Sex and the City, Deadwood, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and all that came after. Now this is a very informal documentary about the making of what was a very groundbreaking show. When Larry Sanders started in 1992, there was really nothing quite like it on television. There was nothing as real, nothing as raw, nothing as funny, and nothing quite as uncomfortable. Francine got hurt. Yeah, right, and now I have to pay for the fact that you're back together with that cunt. Oh my god. Oh my god. Whoa. Oh, no. Whoa. Oh, oh, no. Whoa. Oh, no. What did Whoa. you just say? No. No. I'm so... You didn't <laughs> say... You couldn't have... I'm sorry. Did I hear I just, you? Just, it just... I, uh... I think it's that new hay fever medication. I, uh, I... I... I think it has opium in it. I just... <laughs> Please, have pity. I'm... I'm drowning. I met Gary Shanling at an award show when Sanders was in its first season. I told him I thought the program then was intelligent, seemed to have a sensibility that was admirable. In other words, I kissed his ass just enough to make it onto the show's Emmy-winning and final episode. Look, I thought I was your Bette Midler. This no is bullshit. Problem. Hey, you guys, let's not forget why we're here, all right? It's Larry's final show. Was I talking to you? Well, you are now. Hey, look, this guy's nominated for an Oscar, all right? For what, talk soup? Hey, Grace, take it easy. Great, I'm all right. I'm all right. Whoa, oh, God. I haven't seen such a rumble since the Stones played out tomorrow. Tom Petty and a former talk soup host only on this program. Now, the best way to understand how something as unique and groundbreaking as this show might be created is to understand a little bit about the personal and professional journey of its creator. Not absolutely necessary, but it could help. I was writing for Sanford and Son and some other television shows when I was like 24, 25 years old, mm -hmm. and I got bored very quickly. And I went to the comedy store one night and got up on amateur night. I mean, you don't know what it was like being an unwanted child. My mother had tried to talk her doctor into performing an abortion, but he said he wouldn't do it because it was illegal to perform an abortion once the child had reached the age of 15. <laughs> and I walked off that stage and I thought, my God, this could be a way I could find out who I am because I'm so self-conscious up there that clearly I'm scared to death of being whoever I am. And that began uh, the search. And I think uh, that process continues. At the Comedy Store in Hollywood and at the Comedy Magic Club in Hermosa Beach, California, as I said, this is the first time. So make him feel welcome. Would you welcome Gary Shandling? Gary That's very nice. I'm so excited to be here. I uh, had a great day. I went to the bank uh, earlier today. And uh, have you gotten your free pen yet? These are free. I, you just yank these things and they pop right out. And uh, 
my dad, I used to go camping with my dad, and he's such a wonderful guy. He's older than me, and uh, he, uh, but he's gross. Is your dad gross? I mean, uh, <laughs> my dad comes to the breakfast table like this. What's for breakfast? <laughs> Come on, Dad, we're trying to eat here, huh? <laughs> Wanna put a robe on or something? Just, uh... He came on the show, did his stand-up, and was remarkable. I mean, the audience went wild. Johnny said, this is great. That's, uh, that's nice to see. Thank you, Jim. It's nice to see, nice to see somebody new come out and really uh, have some funny material. His name is Gary Shandling. You'll hear a lot about him. We'll be back right after this. I asked him if he wanted to guest host the show, and he did. And again, it was different from anyone else, more imaginative, fresher. And we booked him back many times as a guest host, and he did it on a regular basis. Great to see you, and thanks, I, I have some water, but thank oh. you anyway. No, now it's great to see you. Thank and, you. Now, am I on the correct side of this to... to Any now, side right now. Now, this is obviously a, a, an incredibly exotic uh, animal. You brought a donkey? But very... <laughs> just for you. No, what, did the guest host get just bad animals? Is that it? And then he got It's Gary Shandling Show, and as we all know, Gary, when he gets involved in a project, really gets involved. And he said, I can't do the guest hosting anymore. This is the theme to Gary show. The theme to Gary show. Gary called me up and asked if I would write his theme song. I got the idea for the Larry Sanders show from my first show, It's Gary Shandling's Show. We did an episode where, uh, of that series where I went on a talk show. It was like a local L.A. talk show. It was Christina Ferrari. And I remember doing that episode, and I remember walking off going, Boy, there's a, there's a show about, from the other side, about the people who host the show. Uh, but really, then I had to decide if that was a show that was going to allow me to explore human interaction and not just be some show about show business. We know that Americans watch a tremendous amount of television. The amount of that percentage that is talk show watching is inordinately high. I knew that the Carson retirement was coming. I knew talk shows would be in the news. So I said, okay, this may be behind the scenes of a subject matter, but it's a subject matter that a hell of a lot of Americans know about. So when Gary called me to pitch this, it had actually been something we were thinking about. But as I've always said in this business, ideas are very, are easier. Execution is what's most important. And in our first conversation, Gary and I was sort of finishing each other's sentences in terms of the mood and tone. Michael offered Gary, I think it was a 13 episode commitment, which was unheard of because here we were in programming saying to ourselves, well, do we even have the money? Should we spend the money? What should we develop? We're developing things. And here, Michael basically had given away all of our money on a, you know, over lunch. They'd gotten the 13 episodes and no pilot. And I, I just assumed that Gary had blown someone. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the typical. <laughs> We're talking about the reality of network TV. This is how, if you really want to strip it down, mm -hmm. this is what's going on. And these guys, you're seeing them behind the scenes, you're seeing them how they pander to the network executives, how they scheme and just slide away. Because, you know, you, it had everything in it. It was, it was, I thought it was just clear from the start that this thing stood out. Gary wanted to make a show that was subversive and different, while HBO needed a show that would ultimately define them as different than network television. Simple enough, right? I mean, they knew all of the characters. All they had to do was begin <laughs> That's a good move. The horrendous, gut-wrenching and shitty process known as casting. And they didn't start by rounding up the usual suspects. Well, Rip Torn was hilarious in Defending Your Life, and, and Dennis Klein was uh, adamant that he was the guy, but I'd never met Rip. And so he came in for a meeting, and he just sat like this the whole time. He had a fishing hat on. 
and he didn't want to read and he would just look up. And I would try talking to him and I'd say, well, Rip, uh, I mean, uh, did you read, uh, did you like the script? Yeah, I liked the script. <laughs> and he wouldn't read. And so uh, he would not read until I called him back a few weeks later because I was stumped. I had been warned by one of my agents who said, uh, don't read. You don't have to read. So Gary said, uh, do you want to read? I says, no. And the next second was the greatest second in my life because instantly I said, do you want to read? I says, no, but I will. And so we improvised for about an hour and a half. People would come in and we started playing the characters like at a uh, discussion about a show and uh, people would come in and he'd take phone calls. I would stay in character, he'd stay in character. And uh, we just had a lot of fun. I just, I just, it's, this is all about her, unless it's defined by her. It's all about Sharon and who, Sharon and who, Sharon and who. This is uncanny. What? Do you know who you just sounded like right now? What is wrong with you? It's kind of like 2nd Avenue, right? <laughs> that reminds me. You're doing Marty Schwartz, right? It reminds me. What is Kreskin talking about? father of five <laughs> fingers. <laughs> that reminds me. Why don't we have more magicians on the show? <laughs> Listen, all right. Listen, I warned you about this. <laughs> okay, get in. I'm going to get a little more. Mm. Mm. I warn you about this. When you're in a show business relationship oh. with a woman more famous than you, she's the one with the dick. The uh, character of, of Artie was mostly based on Fred de Cordova, who was, Fred and I executive produced the show together. Uh, and Fred is the flamboyant character in real life. Many of the attributes of de Cordova, I, that I, since I don't know him, I attribute to him based on stories and things like that. And I think one of them is, as a good producer, he protects his star. He protects his star above all things. He will coddle these people who come on the show, but if any of them turns against Lowry, that's trouble. Well, that's what I put into Artie, all those stories that are read about all those great moguls. Uh -huh. That they, they dress fine, but they were, they were roughnecks too. Mm -hmm. They could get in there and, and if I, well, I used all everything that I had. I used everything I learned in the military and and uh, living on the streets in New York. Rip is such a force of personality. You know, he there, there's so there's such strength to him. I've got alimony checks going out to four different women every month. I mean, it, it, the sting fades after a while. You just you gotta you can't do that while I'm shooting. Let's do it again. I'd like to start my eye way. goes right to movement, you know that. It's because okay. I shoot skeet and birds. Okay, I'd like coming. to go to the top anyway, so yeah. let's just okay. be very still. If you can do me a favor, if you can run this up your shirt. Jesus. Why can't we put it on the outside? Well, because it doesn't look good when they've got the cable going down. Really? No, it looks unprofessional to me. Well, let's do it. I like unprofessional. Okay. There you go. There you go. I mean, why are we hiding it? Yeah. Everybody knows what it is. Just, it's a microphone. Just, uh, just tell us. This is uh, a microphone. Sounds good. <laughs> I don't believe in deception. But I think. So what about, what about beauty? Fuck. Have you, look. <laughs> is it good I've given up on beauty. Uh, are you bothered by you so bothered that you you want to kill yourself? Because I'm I'm a guy I'm a get along guy. Uh, I would rather it. What? Why? Yeah. Because it looks. Yeah. Just that, no, but this is our show. Mm -hmm. This has more to if do this, with it. If this scene yeah. makes it, then that's cool. Yeah. And this is this is actually right here. Yeah. Right this moment. Yep. Yeah. This is what this guy taught me. One camera film is all my my only thing to let you know. This, this is in front of a live audience. Oh, good. Yeah, we were down to uh, we couldn't find anybody. This was like it, we were really close. This uh, Jeffrey was the last person we. Saw. I can't believe you ever said, hey, now as a kid, did you? <laughs> no, or no, no, probably didn't. But I, uh, well, I said, hey, uh -huh. you know, and I, uh, I guess I said now, diff different times. But uh, 
Yeah, Dennis Klein came up with Hey Now, which is so brilliantly simple. All I'm saying is... He's inventing in, a, in an audition, and, you know, it's still inspiring uh, to see uh, someone that courageous. He's really courageous. And I'll tell you the truth, it gets on the audience's nerves. No, sir. Everybody's nervous. No, sir. Uh, look, no, sir. I mean, uh, you're not out there, and uh, believe me, it's, uh, it's very big. It's very big with the audience. I, I, <laughs> I just prefer you not do it on the show anymore, okay? I just, uh, it gets on my nerves, it gets on the audience's nerves as no, well. Sir. No, yes, sir. No, sir. No. Hank? Look, you're not out there. And believe me, it is. It's very big with the audience. No. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something else. I think it helps make the show work. It's part of our whole interplay on camera. By interplay, you mean the times we're both awake? Hey, now. And, and, and I, I think, from my viewpoint, it helps make the uh -huh. show work. It's part of our whole uh -huh. uh, interplay. Uh -huh. A little hot right interplay. now. A little, a whole little interplay on interplay. camera. You mean the time that we're both awake? Is that what you mean? Oh, hey now. Yeah. After this audition, Jeffrey Tambor called me at the gym. Uh, and he said, I, I really know that guy. I really know that guy. I really know that guy. And... Uh, he did. He took an enormous time in casting, forever. I couldn't, I couldn't get him to hire me. I kept saying, well, I got this offer, I got this offer. I did, too. Uh, and and uh, he said, well, you got to do what you got to do. He just would not be rushed. Thank God. Thank God. I mean, because the, the, what, look what we assembled. Uh, one camera film, uh, no live audience, real. Mm -hmm. Do you see the way you look at the cut? And have, and have fun. Okay. And we'll do it a couple times. I was very thrilled to meet him and was thrilled that he was complimentary oh, yeah. towards my stand-up. He didn't really say what the show was trying to accomplish, but it, I, di I did have an understanding that it was going to be a reality, like a, a pseudo-reality based show, and I did know that he liked really naturalistic acting. Yeah, who she screwed. Really? Yeah, she screws everybody. There's no possible way that that didn't happen. Everybody comes on this show, she definitely screwed them. Everybody? Well, not everybody. Everybody who's willing. Oh, come on. That's not true. That's so true. Wake up to smell the infection. <laughs> oh, she's like she's living in the 70s. She's definitely going to catch someone. Some, someone, something. Ah, you improvise. I'm sorry. Yourself I'm so sorry. Uh -huh. I had not acted prior to this, really. Um, the first really acting I had done was some of the stuff for the Ben Stiller show. Um, so by default, I wound up being sort of a naturalistic actor the way he likes, only because I had no idea what I was doing. Listen, I don't know what your problem's been for the last couple of days, but now's the time to uh, suck it up and get over it, okay? I have a lump in my breast. Oh, my God. Oh, no, 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 don't hug, because then it feels serious and cancerous. And please stop staring at my tits. Uh I looked into the room and I saw everybody that was auditioning and I thought, there's nobody here like me. And so I walk in and there's Gary with some other guys and I'm, you know, being nice, hi, hello. And he's saying, hi, you know, the way Gary does. And um, he was asking me about myself and I was telling him and then the phone, it kept reading, it ringing. And I thought, this is rude. Why didn't they turn the phone off? You know, I'm having an interview and it, rung again, and I said, do you mind if I get that? And Gary said, no, go ahead, and I picked up the phone, and um, I told them that, that Gary was busy, and then I hung up, and he said, thank you very much. I'm taken away, when I did this work, I said, okay, now, we're not talking about being funny now, which is what everyone had to get over, because everyone came in going, it's a comedy, right? And when, even when I was auditioning people, they would come in and start to read, and read like, okay, well, this is a comedy, and I'd have to say, whoa, 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 whoa. I got to see if people can get to their core first. Right. Then we'll talk about the comedy. I just went in there, and it was Gary Shandling and John Regi, and they both just sat across from me, and I was like, and Gary was like, hey, what's going on? And I was like, I don't know. What's going on with you? I don't know. What are you doing? Nothing. What are you doing? And then we just went back and forth like that about three more times, and they just like looked at each other, they were like, Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. and that was the audition. And then the next thing I know, I 
had the part of Mary Lou. Beverly? Oh my God, what's wrong? I just hit Hank's car. When? Just now. You're not parked anywhere near Hank's car. You're in another lot. I know, I'm such a bad driver. Well, what happened? I was coming over here to pick up some stuff and I ran into the back of his car. It's like I was drunk. Well, are you? Now? What? Which car did you hit? I don't know. It was really big and foreign, kind of like a big boat. Oh, God. Oh. You hit his Bentley. Is that bad? I was just looking for people who brought power, and I'm really proud of every one of those people. And those people who I sensed had their power and yet didn't know how to bring it and didn't understand because I needed support in bringing my power, so I'm able to look at a person like when Sarah Silverman or Mary Lynn Rice Cobb started the show and to give them that gift to say, no, 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 don't worry. You have nothing to prove here. Your power comes from being yourself. I mean, you get on the set and Gary comes up to you and says, you know, um, whatever your lines are, just, I don't care what you say, just get the idea across. I mean, if you say pineapple, you can say pineapple. And he trusted everybody with communicating the story in their own words. And I think that really, that's a big thing of what made the show great, you know? And it was fun. I really watch these powerhouses like Rip Torn and, and Jeffrey Tambor and Gary and watch them finesse their, their, their own niche in each, as each season progressed. But it's a group of people who I don't think that if you were going to cast a show, you would say, I want these six people. I can only assume that that's what Gary was, well, that's what was very attractive to Gary was, and that's what Gary was really seeing in everybody else was there was uh, something unique in each, in each person. That's why I hired everybody. You know, I'm sorry, Artie. I just can't believe he's pushing this whole religion thing in everyone's face. Well, Phil, I can't believe you're a comedy writer, but we have to take them both on faith. Touche. Just standing right there, we see the one, we see one boom crossing the frame, and Peter Smoker, you're in the image. We had great directors, a plethora of them were directed by Todd Holland, and he had a grasp of this show, and there was great trust, and he had a great, great knowledge of what an actor goes through. I'd never done anything like Larry Sanders at all, and not through three cameras and four wall sets. I mean, I've never, I don't come from sitcoms, I come from single camera, um, a single camera background. And um, what we were doing was very much a hybrid sitcom, you know, kind of style, but with none of the infrastructure or training that comes with a sitcom. So we had to shoot the entire show in two days. And in order to accomplish that, you had to use three cameras to get all of the necessary shots. And we had no money for Steadicam, not, nothing. It was the cheapest show on television. And Peter would rollerblade, and he, got, he was very adept. Our, our master camera was usually me on rollerblades, which I, I've brought here. Someone asked me to bring these rollerblades. Action! Staggering, staggering. You were funny with every guest. Yeah, oh. that old guy fucked us. My grandmother's funnier than that. Well, she's booked for next Thursday. It got to the point where the dolly grip could actually pull him, and Peter would adjust his feet and so that he could actually reverse and be pushed. He could actually do all the moves, and he could push and pull like Peter with, his, with the rollerblades, and it's hilarious. Ha, <laughs> ha. Well, that was staggering. You were funny with every guest. I thought that old yes. guy fucked us. I mean, oh. my grandmother's funnier than that. Well, she's that. booked for next Thursday. When actors have too much time, when you do the clapper and quiet on the set and rolling and clapper, there's a stagnancy that comes in, and they're all in their heads. And they're doing nothing but thinking about their work, you know? And then what also happens is it takes forever, once you say cut, to get to the next time you can roll and do, and do the clapper and get the set quiet and roll sound and all that crap. Both things made me crazy. And I suddenly, I just literally had them, I started screaming, we're not cutting, we're not cutting. We're going back to one. Back to one, we're not cutting, we're not cutting, we're not cutting. Back to one. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry, Paul. Stay with Ready. We'll check from the end. What's going on? I'll tell you later. Where's Larry now? Beverly took him home. We are one hour away from showtime. What do we do? Have the pages send the audience home? We are not canceling this show, goddammit. There wasn't much time to think. You just had to do it, which is... That's the secret to everything. Don't think. Just do it. Dive in. 
dive in, jump off the cliffs, yeah, get wet. And everything's been set into place, all the building blocks, and just now Todd yells, back to one, back to one, back to one, and before you know it, you've integrated it all, and something comes out, and uh, that's how I work. Gary was in charge of the writing. He, had, he was the person who said, this is the draft that's going to the table. And so he and I would sit together and go through scripts, and ultimately, you know, and that would take hours and hours and hours. We'd do it at his house. I was doing uh, Murphy Brown. Right. And Fred Barron brought me in. Pete came in in a briefcase, not <laughs> in a briefcase, <laughs> with a briefcase. Yeah. With some other writer that came in a briefcase. Yeah. He that, didn't, that's a really conservative guy. He didn't work out, as no. I remember. Well, well, we couldn't get the combination to the case. <laughs> I was going to say, you wouldn't leave the case. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I said to you today that I, I'm wearing pretty much the same thing. I, I, a blue yeah, blazer, so he came and in I had a briefcase. And a briefcase. I looked like the show's accountant. Yeah, and I thought, this guy cannot in any way. No way. And I had an idea, and I told him what the idea of an episode was, and I don't know, he just got that it was edgy and different, and uh, he was able to do it right off the bat, more or less. You know, it's a rare thing for a writer when you have uh, an epiphany where you go, wow, I know how to write this. I know how to write this. I know these characters. I can just sit down and it'll come out of me. And I did. I just sat down. I wrote whatever episode I had to write. I think it was the Garden Weasel episode. And it, it, it was just, I just knew the tone of that show. I hooked in with Gary. I fully understood what his sensibility was, what he wanted to say, how he wanted to say it. And it just came out. That rarely happens. And as I got to know him, I realized, first of all, incredibly smart, obviously very funny, but really smart, and knew how to tell a story, knew how to write a script, knew how to edit a script. That comes from a lot of experience when he was a writer. You know, before season started, Gary would start having people come over to the house, and, and we would all kick around story ideas. All the writers would bring their story ideas, and they were sort of one or two liners, and they would come and, uh, Pitch to Gary, pitch to Gary and the whole group, but it was up to Gary. It was a sort of intuitive thing, the one that the ideas that struck him as interesting. And slowly, hopefully, a very rough idea of what the main arc of the season would be comes to the surface. And then you would write an outline for the story, and then Gary would say, "The story doesn't start soon enough." And then you'd write another outline. And Gary would say, the story doesn't start soon enough. That was, I was always remembered. The story just doesn't start early enough. So finally, when you got the story starting on page one, or maybe page two at the latest, he would, that, that you would be OK to go forward with it. I would just try to get Gary to do as much as he could. I mean, I tried to get Gary to rewrite as much of the script. You know, it used to be Gary would leave, and we'd rewrite the script. I was like, well, Gary, it kind of would be easier for me to sit alone with you for two, three hours, and, and we'll work on it together, which was code for you'll rewrite it. Larry, now you know Melanie Parrish. Oh, sure. Well, it's she's out Robert. here now. She's in charge of late night programming. Gentlemen, I'll be brief. We all know what the economic climate of network television is like out there right now. We're getting kicked in the balls. She's a metaphor for the pressure that we have in life. Larry wouldn't have a conflict if he was the boss. Not that this would have changed anything, but I remember people saying, well, I mean, uh, he's this big, successful talk show host, so what's the struggle? Yeah, what's so wrong right. with his life? Yeah. What are people going to, well, this is what happens in everybody's job. He's struggling. It's a, it, that's what this reveals, is that mm -hmm. uh, all these people in show business are human beings. I don't take this as a threat, but I killed a man like you in Korea, hand to hand. My boy doesn't want to do any more commercials. From now on, you'll talk to me. Understood. That's one. Of, that's a line that people still say to me. They, they still say to me, "Yeah, I killed a guy like you in Korea." Yeah. <laughs> that, that, I love. That I tall. love to write for Rip. Yeah. I love to write Artie and Hank. Yeah. Not so much you. <laughs> you know why? No, I don't. But I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm happy to find out after I didn't, all this time. I didn't I think could. I could. I didn't think I could write you better than you could. Was that true? I think that you did a great job writing uh, you know, Larry. You were, I mean, we may you, have adjusted and but stuff. You were much more, um, you, you'd take a script and go, well, I don't think I need to say that. And I can do that with just the look. And I can do, so you'd really pare it down to the, 
it was really great. I, I, I think know. I like doing fewer words than anybody probably. While people yeah. were trying to, yeah, would like to say more, I'd like to say less and do it in a that space right there, that empty space. <laughs> God, you're really upset, aren't you? God, you really care about me, don't you? Are you uncomfortable? A little bit. Gary is an actor I've never seen work harder um, to be an actor, to be a really good actor, and really use the tools of, of working with Roy London and to great benefit. My script, I wish I had the script here. We'll get it later. We'll pull out one of my old scripts. It's just loaded with acting notes for Larry. He took Larry into, you know, fairly dark, painful places and was able to open that out and put it on film. I guest hosted The Tonight Show. I did it a week at a time. After that week, I would go, my God, I could not do this. Uh, first of all, the pressure. Second of all, I think being on TV every night, which changes you. You spend more time working on my stupid 10-minute little spot than you have on our whole relationship. And you know what I think? I think it's more important to you whether or not I'm a good guest on your show. You know... <clears throat> Fucking talk show host, okay? I'm all fucked up. But, you know, Gary has a very specific process, and he kind of tortures himself. I always say, I always look at him and say, it should be easier for him. It should be easier. He's so gifted. You cannot be in your head as a writer and then behave as an actor. So that was also requires great physical energy and emotional internal energy to clear out all of your head from where you've been writing from and now actually feel? There was nothing better than when he was like really into what was I mean, he was always super invested, but that moment where you're like working with him on like a line or something, it's just like very ex exciting because he is so committed to what he's doing. I think Gary honestly has a love-hate relationship with acting and he sort of dreads it. He dreads that he'll be awful at it and he'll look silly and he so he's a lot of fear surrounding it and but he also he's also wants to take the journey and he wants to go on the journey and and learn and grow and he has acting coaches and a lot of really talented people who have helped him and you know and guided him in 1985 I went into this acting class that a friend of mine recommended and it was just a little tiny class in someone's house and there were maybe 15 students and it was Roy London and he was just starting and any which way I would describe him would not capture how much impact, how much influence he had on my life as a person, as an artist. He was an acting teacher who had this brilliant IQ and sensitive besides and insights and passionate, like a spiritual figure. There is no correct in film acting. That is not what it's about. It's about your vision, your need, and bringing your entire life to bear on, on, on your work. To the extent of what, what the work is about, you may not bring your entire life, but to bring your life. Sometimes certain roles require m more, but all of them require that you're bringing where you're at as a, a man, a, a, a woman, a citizen, a, a, an American, a person in society. It's not in a vacuum. So I would call Roy up and I would say, hey, uh, Roy, um, I mean, I got an offer to host a talk show. You think there's any way I can grow in that? But we both uh, thought that doing it night after night after night after night would not lead to the exact kind of growth that a show might that had more serious circumstances. So as I began to think of my first series, It's Gary Shandling Show, I remember saying to Roy, uh, well, I'm not gonna be able to come to class because I've got this show. Can you come to the show and teach me every week? This has always been a very serious and difficult issue. Should someone marry someone just to stay in the country? Let's find out what our audience thinks. <laughs> and as that show became slimmer emotionally, meaning it, it lost its realness and became kind of a cartoon and a sketch show, even though it was really funny. 
uh, I knew I had to stop that show because I couldn't, I didn't feel anything anymore. That's when the Larry Sanders show idea, I had the idea and I called Roy up and I said, can I discover more who am I in a show like this? And he said, if you, you know, if you commit and if the writing is true and you have to go places and feel things that you wouldn't, uh, that you would be afraid of or other people seeing. To see the respect that, that Gary had for Roy was, was really, really beautiful. You, you just saw it and you felt it. So it was really a beautiful thing to watch and to be around. I knew that the uh, devotion that, that people had to Roy and, and what an a exemplary person, human being he was. Mm -hmm. But it, it was more, instead of talking about it, it was put into practice. I turned to those guys when I was having an acting problem. I'd go right to Rip or to Jeffrey and go, I don't know how to play this scene. I will see you uh, tomorrow night. No flipping. Uh, I don't think I, 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 you know, I'm not sure if I know how to do this. That was good. Huh? That was exactly right. That's right? Yeah. Uh, He's exactly right. Okay. It's vulnerability. It's exposing yourself. And I think that's easier for him today than it was then. I mean, acting is risky business. I mean, you put yourself out there. You expose some truth about yourself. And Gary's obsession is to truly expose the truth about himself. So by having Larry one step removed from me, it allows me to explore the sides of me that get angry and the sides of me that feel stupid or need people to like me. You know, I could let Larry show all those things. I would say honestly, Larry is a heightened version of Gary. They are in many ways the same person, they really are. I mean, Gary just brought a lot of his personality to that character. Larry is obsessed with some of the same things that Gary is, to a more comic extent. But even at that comic extent, you go, God, he, he really is that person. So there, again, a fine line between who those two people were. I don't think that Larry Sanders is capable of creating the Larry Sanders show. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, obviously, this is Gary's conception, this show. And it's this character that, it, this, that he can play really well. But it's this whole world around him, you know? And so, I mean, Gary is... Uh, he has got a lot more sides to him, I think, than Larry Sanders. The talk show stuff is such second nature to me. I would do it like a talk show. I had so much experience that I could just make that feel real. It was frighteningly real. It was so accurate, I cannot tell you. That's what was so Brilliant. Let's talk about the series. What the plan for the series, uh, Ellen? It's well, been in the news, as you well know. You know, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I keep hearing little flutters of things. I, I don't watch TV myself. I don't, you own, don't. I don't own a TV, so. You don't own it. Now, why don't you own a TV? It, it influences me too much in my work. I uh, recently caught a, an old Cosby rerun, and suddenly my character is a black 50-year-old gynecologist. And I, just, <laughs> I never knew that the audience was going to get Hank. I, I, I told Gary, I think that's in the other interview as well, I, uh, our first thing was a garden weasel commercial where I had to turn to the audience and go, hey now, and, and I, I said, they're not going to get this, they're not going to understand this, and I kept saying that to myself, and I think I, I think I said it to Gary, and he said, and during the commercial, the commercial for the garden weasel, I did Hey Now, I, my, I was so nervous. I remember practicing in my living room the night before. Well, I'm here to tell you, your weeding days are over. Can I hear you say, Hey Now? Hey Now! Pretty good. But can I hear you say, Hey Now? Hey Now! They got it. I went, Hey Now, and they laughed, and I went, and, and, and there it was, and, and, and Gary was right, and I was wrong. Talk show nights came once every three weeks, and we'd carry the script material from each from the first two episodes into the third week, and we had this little Bible of all the pieces we're carrying that we need to shoot. 
with a live audience. Gary really loved to have a live audience for his stand-up. It was, you know, it's impossible to do, to do stand-up when you're not getting a reaction. And five, four, three, okay. two. Well, welcome back. The audience, uh, okay, here's what we're going to do. With, if you can pretend to have some fucking enthusiasm. No, no. Okay, welcome back. We are back. And the audience would always play along. So you could say to the audience, and I would talk to the audience and do the warm-ups and talk to the audience and say, okay, we're doing a talk show part that fits into a story. And I would tell them, and I'd say, so now you've come tonight and you're just watching the talk show. And I'm gonna, I'll come out and I'll do a monologue and then I'm gonna interview uh, <laughs> Billy Crystal or whomever. And uh, you realize how fast uh, an audience can really adjust and they just started to act like a talk show audience. I mean, it felt like a talk show in there on Wednesday night. In the beginning, one of the exciting things about the show was that we were gonna be able to work with real live, semi-human Hollywood celebrities. So that was, you know, really exciting. The, the issue became how to get them on the show because you know, initially, nobody knew what the show was. The first break, break that we had, actually, was Gary knew Carol Burnett. I had worked with her, too. And I, we were able to go to her and say, would you please come on the show and, and do this thing? Okay, we'll be right back with uh, spider expert uh, Steve Kutcher and uh, Carol Burnett. Don't go away. We'll be right back. When I got the call to do Gary's show, I didn't have to think twice. I wanted to be on it. And it didn't bother me one way, or I, I never thought, oh, am I the type for this show, or am I going to be right for this, or so. I just knew it was going to be fun. Maybe you could talk to costumes about getting, getting you a longer loincloth. I saw your balls. What? I saw your balls. And by virtue of Carol being there, the door opened. People said, hey, I see what this is. And then we had no problem, for the most part, getting celebrities. The celebrities that would go on the Larry Sanders show, was, they didn't mind showing themselves in a negative light. Unlike, you know, usually if they went on a show, it would have to be, god damn it. You don't have to give it up, right, Jonathan? Not so bad. It's kind of in the background. I'm sort of... You know, I can just take, I can take it away. Okay. <laughs> Shit, I felt bad. Hey. <laughs> okay, yeah. guess. Okay. Oh. So All right, look. Oh okay, then you are now going to have that in your mouth on the patio. Ah. We'll see how that works. Let me start over. Celebrities would go on this show and they didn't mind casting themselves in a negative light, which just never happened. Especially when it was their own persona, because they would never be another character. They would be, you know, Sharon Stone would be Sharon Stone. They were as backbiting and insecure and difficult as any characters on the show, any of the, any of the regulars. And it was just, it was wonderful to see it. Larry, we're off the air. This is real life now. Can I be honest with you? Yeah. I'm here for three good reasons. Last show, big ratings, movie coming out. Bim, bam, boom. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be sitting home watching Nightline. As usual. That curtain is a perfect metaphor for how we as human beings behave when we're out in front of people and want to be seen and liked in a certain, and perceived in a certain way. Everybody, once they're out of their house. Celebrity and a talk show kind of thing just exaggerates that. And then once they're back behind the curtain, back in their own house, what really goes on and what are the problems? Hey, Bruno, how you doing? Whoa, 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 whoa. You bumping me? What? The man is singing the fucking goodbye song. I can't believe this shit. Well, I'll have you on another time. Did you just hear what you said? There is no another time. The party is over. This is it. No way to fly. I'm in just me. A man singing to a man. How fucking sick is that? In most regular sitcoms, you're, you're, you're playing the subtext, the, the, the words are the subtext, you know. Hey, I missed you. Where were you today? Because I was waiting for you. Whatever the, whereas 
what really happens in life is uh, all this stuff that's going on underneath and all the stuff that comes out of your mouth to cover that. So I think what Roy London was what did for Gary as an actor, he that that influenced Gary's writing and um, what Gary was trying to achieve with his writing, which was to get to the core of people um, and what their desires and needs were without expre you know openly expressing any of this. Because people don't say what they're thinking, you got to let them behave and uh, see what they say out of that behavior to cover what they're feeling. You can't, they just can't say, I'm feeling sad today. I want to see the person that we know is sad walk in and go, how are you today? Hank, I just got a call from the hospital. Sid's going to be fine. He's OK. What do you mean? Well, it turns out it wasn't his heart. It was a hiatal hernia. It's a hiatal hernia. It's a, a rip in the esophagus. They said he'll be back at work in a couple of days. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? That is so great. Yeah. Just a second. Um, this morning, I just want to get this straight for myself. This morning, they said uh, he wasn't, uh, that he was going to die. He was not going to make it through the day. Yeah, I know. It's a miracle. Fucking doctors. I mean, come on. If you say a person's not going to make it through the day, then he shouldn't make it. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's just so inconsiderate to just put us through this worry. You okay? Just so... I'm so happy. Larry Sanders taught me that it's flawed human behavior is ten times more interesting than correct human behavior. <laughs> characters who are behaving as they would in real life. They're not performing, we're not writing jokes for characters, we're showing characters who are you know, under pressure to do, a, to do a show, misbehaving, behaving badly. So it's, you know, it was a lot of fun. I responded to all of those things. Is your grandmother alive? What? Is she alive? Yes. Well, fuck her. We'll have our bookers scour sunset after midnight. And the first celeb we find getting blown by a hooker, consider him booked. Wow, everyone's salaries are in here. Yeah, that's right, everybody. Oh my God. Look how much Jake the Grip makes. Next time he asks me out, I'm gonna say yes. I knew it. I knew you couldn't resist. You know, what, what, what are they, what are they hiring at UPS? Because you're sporting a very big package. Oh, well, thank you for noticing. Sign here and the package is all yours. Yeah, hey, Mr. Vaughn, I am sorry about the shit I put on your car. See, you get the shit on my car, didn't you, Hank? Huh? Beverly, somebody's been sitting in my chair. Yes, Would sir. you please send out a memo to tell them not to? I, I certainly will. Thank you. But what we did do was steal from our actors because they, we would learn things about them as time went on. And we said, hey, that's an interesting thing. Sometimes a story, but sometimes just a personal attribute. You know, Penny was religious and would, you know, come up to us very, very respectfully and say, I can't say the Lord's name and fucking pussy in the same sentence. So if you can move the Lord's name to another speech, and then I can just say fucking pussy by itself, that'd be great. Let me tell you, in the, the Mr. Sharon Stone episode, when I got that script, first of all, at the table read, it, it had that word in it. And I spelled the word at the table read. And Gary said, are you uncomfortable saying that word? And I said, yes. Okay, and they went on, and I said, okay, they're not gonna cut that. They're gonna make me say that word. Well, then you go, well, that's, that's a great part of the character, somebody who's upset with that kind of language. And from that point on, Penny, uh, Penny's character, was upset with the language in the room. If I wasn't a married man, I uh, guess he was not getting any pussy at home. I'm getting some pussy at home. Gentlemen, excuse me, but how would you guys like it if I stood around here and talked about pussy, huh? How would you like that? Pussy, pussy, I'm gonna go get me some pussy. How would you like that? Well, when you say it that way, it takes the shine off it. But a lot of misbehavior by actors it became scripted behavior. If Jeffrey Tambor was being cocky or arrogant or had an attitude and it felt like Hank-like, like, does Jeffrey know he's acting like Hank right now? And you sometimes, you couldn't tell because everyone's so method, you don't know if they're just kind of in the head of this mm -hmm. attitude you would definitely put it in the show. Well, I was, he helped me on a, on a, a very important turn for, for Hank. Uh, I, I was uh, being less than nice to somebody. 
I, I'm usually a pretty nice guy, but I guess I, I don't know, it kind of went right around. Someone who had the nerve to speak to you. Yeah, because I won't allow that. And because he shouldn't, or I, maybe he was looking me in the eyes, which it was something. Totally it was that thing. You could hear them taking a step. Yes, and uh, you said, "Why don't you add that to? Him? Why don't you add that pettiness?" <laughs> well, you used to ask me about the certain things that you admitted were character flaws, and you yes. said, "Should I put them in Hank?" I says, "Why not?" Did you hear? Larry's banging Sharon stuff. You shut the fuck up and hide that. It's like taking a temple, a Buddhist temple bell, an authentic 2,000 year old Buddhist temple bell, and ringing it and going, well, why does that, can you tell me why that rings so purely? Well, because it's the real thing. Gary would just say, be truthful. In any situation, Gary would say, well, what would you really say? What would you do if that happened? And that was always the answer in any situation. If you really thought about the character, it might be something stupid or ridiculous or funny. Mm -hmm. But what would that character do? And that was another virtue of this show, was that it was, you had to be on your toes. You had to, and Gary would come down. He would be on the, he would be on the set. Or, or the writer of, that, of record of that script would be on the set. And we would change on the moment. Right. Not improv, but he would ch change. It was truly organic. We didn't have to force anything. If it was forced, I'm sure those are all the scenes that Gary cut. Because if, they were, if it wasn't organic, it wasn't his style or his truth. And I think that's what we were getting at for the Larry Sanders show, real truth. I just don't think that there should be a stark difference between what's off camera and what's on camera. It isn't suddenly like, okay, now you start the scene, now you start being human. Action! No, no. See, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like what Shadow did, you know? I told him, Kingsley, we have didn't a plan, I? We have a plan, I'm sorry, let's roll the video again. We'll have to re-rack it then, right? We just have to re-phase. Re-phase. Push it down. No, I told him, Kingsley, didn't I, Kingsley? Look what he does, Kingsley. What a, what a weenus. Do you like weenus? Just stay phased. Tell me when you're phased, Ivan. Don't zoom. Just tell me when you're phased. Hold on and listen. Find your phasing point. You're phased. Roll video. No, roll video. no. God. Wait, it'll be one second. What a dick. Dick breath. Ash. No, no, no. You're so bad. I don't like what he did. I told Shadow I said Kingsley, didn't I? Kingsley. Now, look what he did, Kingsley. What a dip. I, I knew from the, uh, from the very beginning that um, the magic happened in the mistakes. It's something uh, that I've heard Roy say, it's something I felt. And I don't know if it actually was a credo, but it seemed to be one of the components of, is leave the mistakes in. If you trip or you falter, leave, the, f f leave that in. Mm -hmm. And also, not slavishly rehearsing, 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 and then recreating that rehearsal, but actually peaking your performance at the time you are filming it. Roy used to say, the magic is uh, not only in the mistakes, but in fact, if you could capture that actor or those actors in that scene. To discover something about what the script is about and yourself in the script while the camera, there's a camera here somewhere, while the camera's running. Are you willing to do that? Very few people are willing to do that. What most people would like to do is figure out how to do it right before that camera ever shows up and be right, be the right thing. Trying to be the right thing while the camera's running is great, but having figured it out and then, okay, camera, you can come now and I'll show you how this character is. I'm just gonna, I've got it down perfectly. I promise you, is, does not a star make. So the trick is, it's the same as they do with a boxer and the same they do with a racehorse, is you are trained in a certain way to peak, to let it go right at that moment. Television has a long and colorful history of continuing to broadcast good TV until it's not so good anymore. It's bad. You may have seen one of these shows, writhing in pain, strangling itself with its own tired formula until every last drop of creative blood has been sapped from its once vibrant heart. I should be doing more theater. 
Larry Sanders was the exception. That is t t still in this present moment, strangely, my connection to Jerry Seinfeld is how it bumped into him on the, on the lot. And he understood the impossibility of being in a show and writing a show. The thing about television is that it, it always wins in the end. Television always wins. In other words, those, these shows that we had, if we didn't kill them, they would kill us. And it's not a fair fight. And you can subdue it for a period of time, a long period of time. We were fortunate to do it a long period of time. But you know it's only getting stronger and you're only getting weaker. Did you feel that way? Yes. And I knew someday, and I didn't know when it was, it might have been the next season, might have been the one after that, one day this thing was going to smite me down. And so the trick is to make the, the neat and graceful exit before it gets that chance. And people and, and the people on, uh, that, that made my show said, well, look, at they showed me the ratings. They looked, the ratings are still going up. I said, I don't want to know where that line ends. Leonard Cohen has this lyric that is, uh, everything cracks, that's how the light gets in. I don't have any doubt that the pressure of that show and ever more with no support had benefit for the show. I don't think it can, and have benefited in the big cosmic picture for everybody, but I don't think it can be good for the person who's, uh, you know, who's responsible to, to put the thing out and who cares about quality. Well, I, I think I thought the show was probably creatively at its peak. I mean, I, I was never one to drag stuff on, as many a woman will tell you. And the Larry Sanders show was over when Gary said, this is the last season. And uh, I don't think there was a finer thing I've ever seen on television than the final episode. And, and he thought about it for a really long time. And it was a beautiful, perfect ending to an amazing experience for all of us. I called you and said, uh, I have an idea for the last episode, mm -hmm. which is mostly talk show. All right. And we talked for a very short time. And you wrote a first draft of the last episode that it was the funniest table reading we ever had in, uh, uh, for that last episode. Which we won the Emmy for. Which we won the Emmy for. No, there was a lot of work that went into it. Because you remember, we, there, was some, there was also some fortuitous stuff in there because Judd Apatow was working on the show at the time. And Judd got Jim Carrey to do that part. That's right. And I talked Jim Carrey into doing the last episode. Well, that I'm going to take. I talked him into it. I asked him for five years, and then finally I was able to, to, to call him and say, there's only one left. This is your last shot. And then Jim said, I will do the last episode if I can be the best person who's ever done any episode. No, 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 no way. No, 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 no way. We're living without you. We're not living without you. Mm. There's no way. was a very difficult episode. It was emotional, and it was, um, it was, it was many things. I, Gary was, Gary had a monologue. He did the last monologue, and it was a big deal for him. Uh, to you at home, thank you so much. For letting us be in your house every night to entertain you. It's an honor, and uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do without you. Thank you so much. God bless you, and you may not flip. But from the minute he shot that monologue, it was so like cathartic or something that he didn't want to be there from that point on. The most important thing for me, other than that, was to say goodbye to the characters, the characters that we had created and that we had loved so much. I always, I say to Gary, and I've probably said it before, that I, I wrote the first draft of that episode after Gary and I had talked, and, and a lot of those conversations happened over the course of the entire season, where he'd say, hey, you know, in the last episode, we should, and I would write it down. So when I w sat down uh, 
to write it. It was, you know, six months of information that I was able to channel. But I took a post-it note. I always, I've never done this. It's such a goofy thing. But I put the word love on it for this show, of all things, to put the word love on it. And I stuck it on the computer because I wanted to remember as I wrote it how much I loved the characters and how I wanted to send them off in a good way. And I said to Gary, I remember, I said, I know how this ends. I know exactly how this episode ends. And I'm not going to tell you, but I know the last scene of this show. And it's the three of you, because that's the, that's the core of it. Thank you for not letting me say my thank you. I mean, I knew you guys were pieces of shit, but I, you know, I had no idea. <laughs> well, I'll try not to be such an asshole, hey, will you? Don't tell me what to do, OK? You're not my boss anymore. That is over. What is your problem? What is my problem? Hey. The last episode and the last scene to be shot of the last episode was a metaphor for the entire series, which was, it was something like 1 o'clock in the morning, and we'd been shooting since 7 o'clock. And even though this was the last shot of the entire series, you're still going, oh, you've got to be kidding me. We've still got to do that scene. You've got to be kidding me. Gary, I don't know why he said it. He said, I don't know if we should do it. I, I remember saying, you don't think we should do it? This is, the, this is what the six years was all about. I mean, this is it. This is, this is the whole deal. And I got mad at him, which was the second time I got mad at him. And I just said, don't make up, use it. And that's when I chased him up the thing. But you know, it's my fault because I smiled and I let it happen I, because this face was being seen by millions of people every 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 night and there was lots of money and there was lots of pussy well more money than pussy <laughs> no more no more i swear to god no more one more one more remark and i i swear to, I'll, I'll fucking choke you with my hands we did in one take the cameras i remember and the actors were moving as one it was just one of those times when you go you know, you can't do, you, you knew that you had to do the 10th take on the first take. And you just take, took your, and you made it. You just made it work. And I, I tell people about that, and I, I say, if, any, if anything typifies that show, it was that. It was such a thrill to see that uh, everybody, uh, especially Jeffries, his great aria that he had there at the end. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, Gary and I did pretty good, too. And there was all the honesty of uh, missing each other when I talked to him in the scene. It was what it was. And all of this frustration that I was feeling is in that scene when I walk up and I go, That a shithead like you. <laughs> Sit down. Really? You know, now that I see the desk like that, I don't know why we didn't try it before. And, and then the real love between Artie and Larry, even though Artie sees Larry as a huge pain in the ass who requires so much care and coddling and feeding, he still loves him, and he's going to miss him. And I try to channel all of those feelings into the writing of it. Uh, doing tomorrow. You want to come on? Like get together? I've got a date with Indiana uh, Douglas. Oh, good for you. you uh, I hey, guess it's us. I love you. Yeah. I love, I love don't, you. Don't, I love don't, you. Don't, don't. Oh, please. <laughs> yeah. so let's, let's go. Remembering how much fun we had and how creative it was, I. Uh, Uh, I'm profoundly uh, sad because at least I've been trying to talk him into uh, I said, I want to do like Peter Falk does, do one a year or something like that. And I've been hammering that thing. But, but you know, maybe once uh, if a time is over, you got to let it go. I knew it was special. I knew that those, just the vagaries of this business, they don't come along. That, that often, and I knew that it was going to be less than for a long while, um, and um, I was sad to see it go. And that's why I think there was a lot of love on that set because that actually allows for real human connection, and that's love. And 
The winner is Peter Tolan and Gary Shandling for The Gary Shandling Show. Winning and losing, winning and losing is not important. Being nominated Gary, is... Gary, Gary, we, we, we won. Oh, we won. Oh, thank God. Okay, yeah. Oh, being nominated means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> this is so meaningful, uh, especially coming from uh, Mr. Mel Brooks, and uh, represents so much in the history of television and comedy writing, and one of the singular joys I've had working on the Larry Sanders show over the years has been writing with this uh, gentleman, and I'll miss writing the show uh, with him, Pete Tolan, and I'll be thrilled that you, you'll have nothing to complain about on the ride home tonight. <laughs> and Pete, would you like to say a few words? I just think it's very nice for our industry and also for our country as a whole that in 1998, an award for comedy writing can be won by a Gentile, and I thank you. And uh, we share this with everyone on the show, the cast and the crew and everyone. Thank you so much. The show became so appreciated by the people that write about television and then by extension people that write about the cultural life of our country. It, it, it became a show that, you know, if you haven't seen the show, you have to see it. You know, when a show is great, then there's all these other shows that try to be like that show. But all these people that tried to steal that idea they were stealing the wrong thing. Like they were stealing the like concept of a behind the scenes kind of show or something like that. That's not what made the show great. The show was great because of the, the process. Everyone, they should all have stolen the process of it. I have fallen to a lifelong love with the living moment and it's something I learned there. And something I will, I won't direct comedy or drama without a moment that is is genuinely fresh and alive and spontaneous and feels human. I take that experience into everything I've ever done and most importantly I, I try to take the integrity Gary has to do something great and to create something that is human and connected and artful. It was a great learning experience, one, one that has enhanced my life and my career. I... it changed my life. So that is the making of on the Larry Sanders DVD box set Hope you enjoyed yourself, and uh, from all of us, thank you. I think that show was used for me every week as an exercise to explore uh, what I was really feeling and what others were really feeling, and then what we felt together. That's the big curtain. That's the big curtain, you know? This whole facade of this physical existence. What's behind this? That's my next, uh, next show. This is the, perhaps the best honeydew melon on any uh, DVD ever. I haven't done anything but this DVD, but if there's a better honeydew melon, I'd like to do it. I'd like to see it. I'd like to be on that DVD. I fucking hate this. Gary? Look at this oh, place. Bruno. It's like old times. It's incredible. Know, it's incredible. Good to see you, buddy. You look it's fantastic. Great to see you. I feel I know, fantastic. We just put this up for today for the, the first time I'd seen it set up. That's wonderful. I know. Yeah. We did it for the um, DVD. For I'm the... excited. I really am. I've oh. never done this before. I've never narrated a DVD before. And I was thinking about it last night, and I have a great opening. I'm going to talk about how we became friends on uh, it's, it's uh, Gary Shandling's show, and, and uh, just been friends now, I don't know what, 10, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And, uh, you know, maybe at the end of the narration, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Maybe, maybe I'll even get a little emotional. Are you all right? Yeah. Okay. I um, made a mistake. I think I made a big mistake. I fucked up. How? We already did it. You already did, did, I did it? it? I did it. We had, I had some... Who did it? Oh, Greg. Greg Kinnear. He, he wasn't... Greg Kinnear did it? Yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't good. I, I, let me, if I, let me see if I understand this. You, 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 you bumped me. It's the last, 
Larry Sanders show. Yeah. I come on, it's a I bit. I go along wrong. with it. You bump me, that's funny. I know, this is weird. And now you call me up to do the DVD? Right. And, and you're bumping me from the DVD? I know. Nobody gets bumped from I a know. DVD. I never heard of it myself. It's fucking weird. I'm sorry. Well, you'll do the next one. Oh, yeah. That's, that, you know, that's I'm great. Gonna do I'm going to take DVD. that to the bank. Take no, no. Uh, I'm going to do the next, I'm going to do the next that. Gary Shandling show. I don't know what time What's I... What's the name I, of that show? The, Gary the, Shandling fucks over his friend's show? I haven't done that one yet. Yeah. I bet. That felt good. Go fuck yourself. That's a fucking joke. Lose my number.